Good evening, and welcome to the Atlanta Suburban Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated Mental Health Webinar Series. Mental illness can be misunderstood in the African American community. It can cause stress, limit functioning, and interfere with the performance of daily activities. This webinar series seeks to address the stigma and increase the knowledge of mental health care in the African American community. The objective is to normalize and encourage more discussions on the importance of mental wellness and the confidentiality in reaching out for service. The disclaimer for this program, this discussion is for information purposes only. Please consult your medical doctor for advice. And housekeeping rules include, please submit your questions via the chat. The webinar will be recorded and posted on the Atlanta Alumni Chapters YouTube site as a resource. And now I have the esteemed pleasure of introducing our two panelists who will discuss depression. First, we will have Dr. Barnett. Dr. Golda Barnett is currently the medical director for Miller Brooks within the Tanner Health System. Dr. Barnett is a board certified adult psychiatrist. He completed his BS MD and residency education training and supervision at Emory University and Emory University School of Medicine. His extensive training includes his tenure at the Grady Health System covering inpatient, outpatient, opioid treatment, as well as psychiatric consultation services with the emergency department and other medical units. He has over 18 years of experience and continues to advocate for mental health, supporting families and patients in recovering functionality to regain quality of life. Please welcome Dr. Barnett. And now I will also introduce Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee is, sorry, Erica Marshall Lee is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Emory University School of Medicine and assistant vice chair for faculty development, diversity, e e equity, and inclusion. She is a clinical director of the Psychosocial Rehabilitation Peer Clinic that provides services to adults with the serious mental disorders within the Grady Behavioral Health System in Atlanta, Georgia. Her areas of expertise and in interest include service delivery to individuals with serious and persistent mental health concerns, training healthcare providers using a social justice advocacy framework, and improving faculty development and postdoctoral residency education related to multiculturalism and advocacy. So please welcome first our guest, Dr. Barnett. And after Dr. Barnett, we will certainly hear from Dr. Lee. Dr. Barnett, please take it away. Thank you very much uh, for that warm welcome. And can everybody hear me? Give me a thumbs up somebody. <clears throat> Um, and I'd like to say again, thank you for the welcome, and uh, and I really do appreciate this opportunity to uh, to uh, to share my love and appreciation for all things mental health, but also to have this opportunity to uh, to share with everyone the importance of not only mental health but uh, the role that major depression can play in our lives. Um, if there's any takeaway from what I share with you all tonight is to have an understanding that um, mental, uh, that major depression, it's, it's an illness. We can talk about depression and depression itself can be a mood, it can be a state of being, but we're talking about major depression and I'm gonna go into the definition of what that means and how we define it as an illness. Um, but one of the defining characteristics with it is it's impairing. It can be disruptive, it can be debilitating, it can be 
destructive, not only for the individuals that, that are suffering from depression, but also loved ones and, and family and friends um, outside of intimate partners, and even just colleagues and individuals who just happen to come across individuals and can have empathy for another person. Um, so I do want to get started with the true definition of this uh, as an illness. And um, I'm going to start off with the definition as defined by what some people call our Bible as it relates to um, mental health, um, uh, mental health uh, providers. Uh, and that's the, the DSM-5 or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental uh, Disorders, the fifth edition. And it defines major depression as, as following, which is having five of the next nine symptoms uh, that I'm going to share over a two-week period. And in that two-week period, an individual has to either have depressed mood or what we call anhedonia, which is the loss of interest or pleasure in things or people or activities, uh, along with uh, three or four other symptoms totaling five over a two-week period. And during that period of time, uh, it should be most days of those two weeks, and it should be most of the individual days that individuals are experiencing these symptoms. Uh, and two weeks is very important because that helps separate it from, again, just being down, being frustrated. Something has happened. Uh, something has happened at work. Somebody has crossed you. You've seen the wrong thing in the news. Again, it separates uh, a longer term illness and it separates uh, a degree of impairment from things that most people will experience at some point on a regular basis. And so the entirety of the symptoms include, as I mentioned before, depressed mood. And for children, um, just be aware that they can present predominantly with an irritable mood or anger. <clears throat> uh, and this is also separate from, uh, for parents out there uh, who are concerned about uh, mental health of their children or other people's kids. Uh, this is separate from uh, children who predominantly have issues with irritable mood and anger, and that's their predominant symptom. Uh, that's dis disruptive mood dysregulation uh, disorder. So uh, again, very important, but still separate. Uh, for adults, we can have irritability, poor frustration tolerance. You could be short with it in terms of your responses to family and friends uh, or colleagues at work, um, but predominantly it is sadness. Uh, the other symptom that one should have if not depression is, as I mentioned before, anhedonia. So decreased interest uh, in or pleasure from activities, hobbies. So if someone likes to read, that person either is not interested in reading or reading doesn't give them any pleasure and therefore their interest drops off. It could be, you know, watching movies pre-COVID, it could be going out, <laughs> um, but it could also be something as simple as um, individuals not really caring to interact with grandkids or their own children uh, or seeing family members, hanging out with friends, uh, talking, being in the sun, um, going for walks. Um, next, we have significant changes in appetite or weight. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to entertainment media, uh, it's very easy for them to simplify uh, showing someone who's depressed by um, having a, a neurotic woman who under stress begins to stress eat. And, you know, uh, even though it's entertainment media, it does have some truth, not necessarily that it's a neurotic woman or neurotic person, but that is a, a caveat to depression where individuals can start to eat more. Um, but it can also be the opposite. Individuals can have uh, lacking appetite and have uh, a drop in weight uh, resulting from that. That could also be related to uh, things having less pleasure, so the, the act of eating being less pleasurable, as well as taste becoming muted. Uh, we could have significant sleep disturbance, so it's very similar to appetite and weight changes. It could be up or down. Um, so you can have individuals that are sleeping too much, 23, 22 hours out of a 24 day, 24 hour day, um, or they're not sleeping uh, very much at all. Um, and, and in my practice, I haven't come across anyone who is depressed that is not wanting to sleep or doesn't need to sleep. They literally can't sleep. Um, and it might be intrusive, negative thoughts. And they're sitting there trying to sleep, but all they can think about is, 
what did they do wrong today? What have they done wrong for the entirety of their life? Why they deserve to experience what they are right now? Or why, you know, the lives of their loved ones would be better without them? Uh, these are things that can disturb people's sleep. And also be aware that individuals could appear to be asleep, but they're just lying, staring at the insides of their eyelids. And they're having that same process of just thinking about things, thinking about their next worry, uh, what's going to happen tomorrow, anticipating things which have yet to happen. Again, thinking about things that they've done in the past and whether that's a, a true perception or not. Uh, these are things that can disturb individual sleep and actually interfere with their dreams as well. So individuals can ex excessively sleep, but it not be restful sleep. And that lead to uh, the next symptom of uh, decreased energy fatigue. And it's not just being tired. It is not having the energy to get out of bed, uh, not having the energy to brush one's teeth, to comb your hair, um, to um, finish tasks, uh, significant delay in uh, um, participating in, you know, mandatory tasks, things that they have to uh, accomplish either for their jobs or for themselves or for their home. Um, furthermore, they can have psychomotor agitation or retardation. So psychomotor is just, you know, moving around. Uh, generally, I see in my practice, I see individuals who just have retardation, meaning, again, if you think about someone who's fatigued, having lacking interest in things, they're just kind of sitting there. Um, they're not really kind of getting up. You can you see them sitting in a chair and you can go out and come back in two hours and they're in the same spot and maybe the TV's off. Maybe nothing is going on around them. They're just sitting on the bed or lying on the bed. They haven't moved in several hours. Uh, agitation, so far as my own uh, experience with patients, is more like kind of fidgeting, kind of just kind of sitting in the chair, uh, maybe going along with anxiety. Um, and next, this is a big symptom here. Uh, feelings of worthlessness. Um, and in my practice, when I evaluate patients uh, and uh, summarize those evaluations, I tend to also ask about feelings of helplessness or hope hopelessness. And I alluded to this earlier uh, when I mentioned individuals not feeling like they are worth anything. They don't feel like they're worth love. They don't feel like they're worth recovery. They don't feel like uh, they are uh, Worth, worthy of friendship or even relief from what they're suffering. Um, <clears throat> and with that, they can be hopeless. Like there's nothing is going to change. Things are going to be worse. Helplessness, no one can help me. No one wants to help me. And these are, these are all experiences that are mostly not factual, not actual. Uh, we also have poor concentration. And I, I mentioned here, short-term memory, recollection, um, and I'm not a boomer, but this is sort of a boomer thing to say. Uh, <laughs> the first example I always want to bring up is, you know, if, someone's, if someone was reading a newspaper, but if someone was on their tablet and uh, reading an article or something, and they find themselves having to read a section several times, or even if you're watching TV or a movie, and you find, or the news, and you find yourself, what, what did they just say? What, what did I just hear? And if there's someone with you that can you know, having to ask that person to kind of summarize, you know, what, you know, what was just, what was just said. Um, <clears throat> and indecisiveness, am I going to get up? Uh, am I going to go to work? Um, can I come up with an excuse? I don't know. Am I going to eat? Am I hungry? Um, do I want to say anything to my kids? Do I just want to get them out the house and, and get them on the bus? Um, and Lastly, of the nine uh, specific symptoms, uh, but definitely not the least, uh, recurrent thoughts of death uh, or suicide, plans of suicide and suicide attempts. Um, passive thoughts of death, uh, meaning, you know, if I wasn't here, you know, if I were to die tomorrow, not that I would do anything to, to, to cause my own demise, but if I were gone tomorrow, you know, it wouldn't be so bad. Or... What would it benefit others for me not to be here, um, or if I wasn't in individuals' lives? Um, you know, having plans for suicide is is very serious. Suicide attempts, be it uh, suicidal, uh, a formal suicide attempt, or uh, some individuals say suicidal gestures. I say parasuicide attempts, meaning individuals who may attempt something that looks suicidal, but it's for the purpose of other things, like you know, it's reactive. Um, 
it's retaliatory. You know, uh, someone told me, you know, get out of their life uh, or I can't have a particular thing. So I go out and in front of them or I go and take pills and I go and show them what I just did. That's still significant. Uh, that might not be due to depression, but still, this is very significant and uh, should lead to um, uh, calls to 911 or um, crisis or the or crisis, the local crisis line. So, <clears throat> uh, to find to finish out the definition as a, uh, as in the DSM, uh, and as I mentioned at the very beginning, these symptoms are cause significant distress or impairment. So it's not just the blues, it's not feeling down, because we should all feel that way at some point, because not everything in our lives goes completely well, or as we anticipated at every moment, and we get disappointments as well, you know, at home in our relationships and definitely on the job. Um, and again, in this year of COVID, uh, and the many years of uh, political and um, uh, police strife, we can have other areas of strife uh, in terms of social uh, unrest. Um, also, uh, this next, this second paragraph is just technical. It isn't something that most uh, most of the population needs to care about, um, because as practitioners, uh, when we see symptoms of major depression, we still address it. These these next caveats just uh, may impact how uh, we address it uh, more specifically with medications, but. We want to make sure that the depression in and of itself isn't related to alcohol or other substances like um, opiates, um, heroin, uh, cocaine, methamphetamines, party drugs, prescription medications as well. <clears throat> um, typically, the depression symptoms related to substances, I don't want to say typically, but many times the recovery from that can be much, much, much faster. Um, than uh, than a major depressive disorder, as I'm describing. Um, but it can also be longstanding as well, because individuals with substance use, uh, some of them may be depressed and may have a sense of guilt, may have a sense of worthlessness or helplessness or hopelessness. They also may have thoughts of death or suicide. Um, it's not related to, depression ep ep episode is not related to uh, these next illnesses like schizoaffective disorder, schizophrenia, are all uh, primary psychotic illnesses. And these illnesses can have some symptoms that may appear to be uh, depressive uh, symptoms by you know, lack of energy and motivation, uh, lack of social engagement, uh, which will look like isolation. Um, and also uh, there hasn't been a manic or hypomanic episode. Uh, in that regard, this is just to help uh, clinicians and practitioners uh, adjust how we treat the depressive episode. So if someone has a bipolar illness and now has a depressive episode, that just that just changes how uh, we describe it. So instead of saying this is a major depressive episode, we would say this is a bipolar disorder type one or two with a depressive episode. Uh, and again, um, from a medication perspective, that will or should impact um, the different types of medications that uh, we would consider and then recommend to our clients. So I described it in terms of uh, the books, um, but how is it that individuals experience it? Uh, now this first line here, I say, you know, depression can have different flavors and etiologies and flavors, meaning uh, as a practitioner, I will describe a major depressive episode as a single episode, so someone has only had one depressive episode over their life versus recurrent, they've had at least one previous episode. It's mild or moderate or severe and severe with psychotic features. It can be an atypical depression. It can be melancholic. So it can have different flavors. A lot of the treatments, at least from a medication standpoint, are fairly similar. Um, but there are some medications we can choose to better address some symptoms like anxiety, lack of sleep or sleeping too much, lack of energy, um, and even uh, predominant suicidal thoughts. But the etiologies can be different. So they could be a bi biological, environmental, and I, sh I should just combine environmental and situational here. Uh, and what I mean by that is um, when I talk to a patient that is newly experiencing depression, and unfortunately, if I'm seeing them, that means that they're in the hospital. But I will tell them there are some people that from a biological perspective, 
may say, you know, Doc, my, my life is great, but I'm depressed. But there's no reason I should be depressed, but I am. And, you know, I'm taking a little poetic license. They probably aren't sharing that much energy when they say it that way. And then you can have another individual who is, you know, is newly homeless, has lost their job, has lost uh, a family member to illness or has lost uh, a, a member in a, a very uh, close relationship. Um, that person could say, you know, who wouldn't be depressed with what's going on with me? Doc, you'd be depressed, wouldn't you? Now, I have a certain way of answering that with my patients, but uh, but in my head, I probably in, in many instances, I was like, yeah, I probably would be depressed. Um, and we still treat it. Uh, there is, I'm going to take a little bit of side here. There is no real treatment to for homelessness, for um, losses. Those losses are still there. That homelessness is still there. But what we seek to do in those instances is to alleviate the, as much as we can the burden and the impairment of these symptoms, so the, of symptoms of depression, so that they can better utilize the services and support to address their depression. Um, and as I mentioned uh, in the next paragraph, depression can be insidious. Um, it can encourage individuals, sufferers, to do things that feed the depression itself, um, such as isolating. Um, so, you know, if you have a feeling like I'm not worthy of love, I'm not worthy of attention, um, that can also lead to nobody loves me, nobody wants me, everybody hates me. So I'm just going to shut myself up in this room here. Or, you know, I just feel sleepy, so I'm going to, and I say hiding in one's case, so I'm just going to lie here with the shades drawn and the door closed, and I might be in a house of five people, but I'm going to be by myself in the dark. And these are things which, again, reinforce those depressive symptoms. So I'm isolated in my room. I'm not eating much, or I go and get food, and I eat more than I would and at inappropriate times, uh, you know, at different times throughout the day and night. Um, Line three here, um, a person, please realize that a person does not have to appear depressed, nor do they have to appear depressed all the time. Individuals who have severe depression can still smile. They can still laugh. Um, they can even um, actively put up a, a facade. Um, but these the symptoms are still there. It is very important for individuals if they can recognize it themselves, but also loved ones, uh, individuals close to them to also uh, recognize the symptoms that are there. And again, someone does not have to say, you know, I'm sad or depressed, but if you can pick up on these things, it's very important so we can start to reach out to those individuals or if the individual who's suffering it, maybe they can get a sense that maybe, you know, they can reach out to others for help. Um, and again, as I mentioned up above uh, or earlier, Mental health is just as important as physical health, and, uh, and mental illness is just as important as physical illness. They respond very similarly uh, to uh, treatment and lack of treatment. A depressive episode increases the risk of having a second depressive episode. A second depressive episode uh, puts you at increased risk for a third and a fourth. The time between the episodes shortens or can shorten. The severity of the symptoms and episodes themselves can become worse. The response to treatment, if it's disruptive, if it's disrupted, um, can also become more complicated. Um, depression can also affect our physical health. Uh, depression and stress can affect heart health or cardiac health. Uh, indirectly, if we're not eating well, if we're not motivated to take medications or <clears throat> have our uh, physicals and follow-up, again, that can lead to uh, 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 worsen physical illness as well, uh, even when it comes to pain. And there are a number of individuals that have longstanding uh, uh, physical pain that contributes or even causes their depression. And with major depression, uh, with what we call pain gating, how we how the brain registers pain from other areas in the body, even that can be amplified uh, or exaggerated with depression. Example that I give patients uh, quite often um, is individual without major depression can run and stub their toe. And maybe for the next 30 seconds or a minute, it's really bad. And for the next two or three minutes, 
it's uncomfortable. But after that, you go about your day. If I'm really depressed, I step my toe. That might be it for me for the rest of the day or at least for an hour or two. It is just throbbing and painful, and people may look at you and say, that's ridiculous. Stop it. That's not that bad. But to them, it truly is, uh, and that is truly a severe pain that they're experiencing. Uh, I'm going to run through the numbers really quickly, but I do uh, – want to just point out some things as we go along. Uh, so the next series of slides are from the National Institute of Mental Health uh, for 2017 uh, for adults. There are some slides related to uh, similar numbers related to adolescents, uh, but this is for uh, past year prevalence in 2017. So that means that in 2017, these are the <clears throat> individuals who reported having at least one major depressive episode during that year. Uh, and it, so it doesn't separate individuals that have had two or three in the year or even past depressive episodes. In that year alone, 17.3 million adults in the United States at that time, that compromised 7% of United States adults had a depressive episode. Uh, the rates in females was 8.7 compared to males. Uh, some of the uh, literature uh, and percentages that I'll show later on shows more of a two to one perspective. Um, this is close to it, but not quite. Uh, the prevalence of adults having, uh, it was also higher in, uh, in adults uh, age, uh, aged 18 to 25. And then it was also uh, fairly high among adults who reported themselves to be of biracial, multiracial descent. And it is also consistent with uh, adolescence, uh, which I'll show and I'll run through that a little bit faster. Um, and also 2017, uh, 11 million 11 million U.S. adults age 18 or older had at least one major depressive episode, and they rated it se a, a severe impairment. And uh, of the adults with major depressive episodes, 60, about 64 individuals rated their depression as severe. Um, and this is a slide regarding treatment. What I wanted to see, wanted to show you here, this is in comparison to children. 35% uh, of adults with major depression did not receive any treatment. Again, this is just for individuals that reported having depression. Uh, for children, what I want to relate here, uh, for adolescents rather 12 to 17, 3.2% or 13, oh, sorry, 3.2 million or 13% of children in that year reported uh, having a depressive episode. 20% of females compared to 6.8 in males. Um, and then um, also uh, highest rated highest among adolescents who reported to be of biracial or multiracial descent. Um, <clears throat> and I want to just show this last bullet point here of the individuals that had a major depressive episode, 70% of these children rated as severe impairment. Uh, from this slide, I just really want to point to one thing. 60% of adolescents with a major de depressive episode did not receive any treatment. Um, and I'm going to skip over this one other than this is just additional information from the CDC's National Center for Health Statistics. Um, what I want you to know is for Americans in general, from 2007 to 2015, rates of depression did not change significantly. Also, what I want you to know is the prevalence of depression decreased as family income levels increased. So when we talk about income, when we talk about wealth and how important it is, it is also important for your mental health. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm going to end on these last two slides. So here, um, this is from the National Survey on uh, Drug Use and Health. 16% um, of Black and African American, oh, I'm sorry, I want to start at the last two. Serious mental illness increased, whereas amongst the population in general, it stayed about the same. It increased for Black and African Americans between 2008 and 2016. Race of suicidal thoughts and attempts also increased uh, in our population. Uh, going back to the first two slides, 16% of African, Black and African Americans reported mental illness or mental health issues, and 22 reporting serious mental illness in the year. Um, living below poverty level it, uh, was two times as likely to report psychological, psychological distress as individuals two times above poverty level. And poverty level is not high. So two times poverty level is not great. Um, here's a list of the various treatment interventions and with questions. And obviously my colleagues will also go into this uh, as well. Um, 
but it is important to consider psychotherapy in addition to medication therapy. Uh, medication therapy by itself does, by studies, work a, has individuals respond a little bit faster than individuals who just receive this, uh, talk therapy itself, but together, there it is faster than either individually. Um, there's electroconvulsive therapy, which sounds scary, but is probably safer than many of the medications <laughs> that we recommend in terms of side effects and adverse reactions. We have in, uh, intensive outpatient treatment, which is essentially like going to the hospital, the psychiatric hospital, but instead of staying there, you come from home, you stay there for half of a day, you eat, you go back home. And then you have where I spend most of, most of my time, uh, inpatient treatment. Um, and of course, that's, individuals are usually there because of the severity of their illness and risk of injury. Um, and finally, I do wanna add, um, uh, this is a question slash statement, the middle one here. Uh, can church and faith-based practice and spirituality be a part of treatment? And absolutely, yes. Uh, from mental health and physical health, there have been studies that show that individuals who do have faith and religious faith-based practices can have uh, a faster recovery, may even tolerate um, more difficult procedures a little bit better. It, and it's, it's not a statement of what faith uh, is spirituality and faith in general. Um, um, if your your if your church or religious organization has counseling or other supportive means, uh, please reach out to them. And if you're able, please you know contribute um, contribute to uh, their efforts. Um, unfortunately, uh, a lot of psychiatrists may stray away from talking about um, religion and spirituality for you know, fear of uh, neutrality and, and uh, what if the patient asks me, you know, <laughs> what my beliefs are. Um, I don't really mind that. There are some patients in some situations where I may choose not to share that with a patient, but for the most part, I'll share that uh, and encourage them if they also practice or have specific, uh, specific beliefs to uh, try to utilize that in their recovery. Uh, and lastly, as everybody can imagine, um, COVID-19, has just wrecked everybody. Um, uh, practitioners uh, on the medical and psychiatric end, uh, patients, individuals that never thought they would have ever been seeking uh, mental health support. Um, so uh, this is a very trying time. And so we should be looking out for ourselves as well as looking out for each other. Uh, and with that, um, I am done and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Barnett. That was a great presentation and overview of major depression. And uh, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, and I'm excited that we are having this discussion tonight. Now we're gonna move forward with Dr. Lee who will discuss psychology and depression. Dr. Lee. Hello everyone. And uh, I am so very honored to be here talking amongst you today. Um, I am going to be sharing my screen and hopefully I can get it to work correctly. Um, here we go. All right, this is not quite doing what I wanted to do. here, but okay, so my talk today is about psychology and depression. Um, let me see if I can't adjust it to the full screen. Let's see. it set up right at first, believe you me. Oh. Okay, so here we go. I think that's better. A little bit about me. Basically, I am, um, I went to the University of Mississippi uh, for undergrad and grad. I went to UAB for my internship. 
and I did a postdoc uh, at Emory School of Medicine and became faculty. So I am employed by Emory, but I am primarily um, at Grady, where I am in the psychosocial rehabilitation clinic, and I work with adults with serious and persistent mental disorders in groups, uh, individual therapy, supervision, and program development. So basically, um, who do you go to? Who do you call when you want to see someone for if you feel like you have depression or somebody suggested, you know, you know, it seems like things are not exactly okay kosher with you. Um, who do you, how do you decide? So when you talk about deciding between psychiatrists and psychologists, as Dr. Barnett already kind of talked about, with psychologists, we are trained basically to um, deal with issues and concerns of the mind, mentally um, focused. With psychiatrists, they also look at those same mental health concerns, but they also look at the neurological and biological basis of certain disorders. So with psychiatrists, they're really going to kind of rule out though any other kinds of physical health concerns, whereas psychologists kind of go straight for the mental health concerns and focus on that. But both are gonna talk through your problems with the goal of assisting with managing and, and helping with those everyday life in crisis situations. How they're different, psychiatrists are medical doctors. They have their medical degrees and they graduate from medical school. They have a year of medical internship, three years of residency in the assessment and treatment of specifically, they specialize in treating mental health disorders after having their um, medical um, internship and medical training. Psychologists have a doctoral degree in an area of psychology. And I say in an area of psychology because it could be, they could specialize in social psychology, clinical psychology, counseling psychology, industrial psychology, school psychology, but they study the mind and human behavior. Um, they can have either PhDs or PsyDs. And when I speak of a PhD, that's a doctorate in philosophy. And um, basically that people who have doctorate in philosophy have diff they're called scientist practitioner models. So they will be going to school and they will learn the basics of mental health but also they'll also have training in assessment and they will have training um, in, in how to do research for applying their science. PsyDs are, they go to school and they have their doctorates in psychology with the major focus of the study of the mind. So everything with regard to, you know, going back to that, that Bible uh, that Dr. Barnett mentioned, everything that's what we call diagnostic and statistical manual focus, that's where the societies are going to have a really heavy emphasis. They also do uh, have a heavy emphasis in, um, in assessment too. So they're going to be trained to kind of provide assessments, um, psychological assessments with regard to diagnostic clarity when you're coming in. We have one to two years of internship, depending on the specialty that you're going into. And as I said, we're trained in administering psychological assessments. Whereas psychiatrists can prescribe medications, psychologists on, in general cannot. There are a few states that will allow it, but um, it is, and it's still limited to a certain number of psychiatric medications. Psychiatrists have gone to school, so they know the, gone to medical school, so they know the interaction of other drugs, uh, prescribed medications. So the approach, psychologists look closely at behavior. We look at what you're doing. We, we talk to you about what, what's going on with you, but we really look, about, look at you and kind of focus on what's going on for you with your in your environment and in your thoughts. Um, psychiatrists focus on, as I said, the biological and neuro neurochemical nature of behavior when they're approaching mental health. Who should you call? Well, both are going to be covered equally by insurance programs. So you can look at that. And both will work on sliding scales when it comes to like paying out of pocket. Psychiatrists may be more likely to evaluate, like I said, those underlying medical problems or drug effects that could cause emotional behavioral symptoms. So if there's a medical problem that might be leading to some, some depressive symptoms, your psychiatrist is going to kind of know, all right, well, let's rule out this before we talk about severe medical, um, major mental health disorder, major depressive disorder. So, and it also depends on your presenting problems. Somebody who might be clinically depressed might be, might be, Benefiting, they can benefit from taking meds, as, as Dr. Barnett pointed out. That's going to probably be the, the quickest step, step in the door if you're going to alleviate those severe symptoms. While somebody who's dealing with a phobia or, or might 
find therapy with a psychologist more effective a more effective choice initially because we're really looking at behavior and that could be phobias of social situations it could be phobias of, of roaches um, but really where the rubber meets the road is what we want you to do is just if you're worried about being depressed or some other mental health issue doesn't matter who you go to just go to somebody and that person will direct you in the, on the along the right path um, both psychology and psychology are built around it having really meaningful, trusting relationships. They're going to be confidential. They're only going to be a certain number of situations where there's going to be that break in confidentiality. And that is if you're going to hurt yourself or someone else, um, and if you're hurting a child, basically. So moving further along these lines to kind of spell it out even more, um, when we're talking about folks who can provide psychological assessments and therapy, but we can't provide medications, we're looking at psych clinical psychologists who have a doctoral degree in psychology, they can diagnose, do individual and group therapy. School psychologists have an advanced degree in school psychology. And so they're trained to, do, to diagnose individual and group therapy, but they also work with, with kids at school and school staff to be able to maximize any kind of efficiency for, for assisting and reaching out to, to make sure that those students who potentially might have mental health concerns are um, prioritized and are there, the approach is met. There's a strategy for dealing with, with whatever is going on to meet the needs of the students. These, the, the, uh, these little mental health providers below, they can provide counseling and with proper training, they can provide assessments, but they can't provide uh, uh, medication. So folks who have their clinical social workers, they have a master's degree in social work. Again, they can diagnose, provide individual and group therapy, do case management, and they are mental health uh, advocacy uh, and social justice advocacy. Uh, clinical social workers are masters in being advocates. Licensed professional psych counselors also have a master's degree in psychology or counseling or a related field, and they can also diagnose, do individual and group counseling. A mental health counselor might have a master's degree. It doesn't have to be in psychology or related field, but they have several years of supervised clinical experience working in that area. For instance, if they're working in a program that is one like mine, um, with that is a psychosocial rehabilitation program, they might not have a master's degree in psychology. It could be in a related field or it could be in, um, in rehabilitation, vocational rehabilitation. But with that supervised clinical work experience, they are able to kind of gently diagnose and provide that individual and group counseling. These mental health providers will, can provide counseling and with proper training, again, assessments, but they can't provide medication. You might come across someone who is a certified alcohol and drug abuse counselor. And when, as Dr. Barnett talked about earlier, sometimes there is depression that's present and it, ha it is related to some sort of substance abuse. So these folks are actually experts at providing that type of um, individual and group counseling, that they can do clinical training in alcohol and drug abuse. You also can have nurses who um, provide psychotherapy, but they are registered nurses and their, their training is in psychiatric and mental health nursing specifically, so they specialize in this type of treatment. Again, they can diagnose, provide individual and group counseling. You also might have, if, if Depression, as Dr. Barnett also pointed out, it can be environmental, it can be situational. You might be in a bad relationship or a problematic relationship or a challenging relationship. So you might go to a marital and family therapist to deal with the depression that's part of the family or marital unit. And these folks are going to have a master's degree with that specialization in marital and family therapy. Again, they can diagnose, provide individual group counseling. And as Dr. Barnett mentioned at the very end of his talk, um, there are pastoral counselors and they have training in clinical pastoral education. So they can provide that individual and group counseling as well as they have that training and background in diagnosing. Finally, on this slide, um, there are what we have peer specialists and the peer certified peer specialists actually have specialized training, but they also have lived experience with mental health or substance use conditions. And they are part of, of certain programs and, and actually engage usually in most mental health settings, including hospitals, to be able to provide um, the clients, and I often call them consumers because um, we don't really call them patients with when our recovery, recovery model, but certified peer specialists will help 
the clients along with Recovery by talking and really they're wanting to empower, they're wanting to um, develop a sense of independence and not no, so much reliance on hospital and hospital settings, but more on recovery settings. So for instance, if they're having a challenge or a problem, it's like the first thing to do might not be to go to the ER at the hospital, but kind of maybe talk about calling Georgia Crisis Mental Health Line or Georgia Me Mental Health Consumer Network, other resources to be able to handle those situations in a way that empowers the individual and doesn't put them in that sick role, helps with setting goals, to do this, so there are hours and hours of training and they have to pass a test to become a certified peer specialist. There are other ther therapists that have advanced degrees where they're trained in specialized form of therapy, like you know, your speech therapist, your art therapist, music therapist, play therapy is part of um, other therapists. Um, here we have, when we're talking about people who can prescribe medication, but may not provide therapy. Now, psychiatrists are reason know they can provide therapy. Um, but they are medical doctors with that specialized training in the diagnosis and treatment of mental emotional illnesses. Um, they oftentimes don't, in these days, they have, the, with their book schedules, usually it's 15 minutes, boom, 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 they've got, in our setting, they've got a lot of people to see. Um, but they are always able to extend extra time to go in and provide that mental health therapy, um, psychotherapy that we do in, as psychologists. Same thing with the child and adolescent psychiatrists. They're going to have specialized training in treating the emotional behavior problems with children. They can prescribe and they can also provide uh, psychotherapy, but they might not. I say this because you want, when you talk to and, and reach out to your providers, you might want to talk to them about what, what, what that looks like from their perspective. You, have, you can also have psychiatric and mental health nurse practitioners. They are registered nurse practitioners with graduate degrees and specialized training uh, in the area of mental health and emotional illness, and they can prescribe uh, medication, but oftentimes don't really see people for any kind of psychotherapy. Additionally, you, you can go for, for prescription of medication. I always recommend going to a psychi psychiatrist because they're going to be more probably more up on what's the most recent news and, and proper protocol, um, best practices for mental health um, disorders. So what are some resources that you can go to? You can go to people in private practice or you can go to folks who are part of, of um, interdisciplinary settings. In private practice, it functions, they function from nine to five, just like everyone else. The, 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 the location could be in their home, it could be in the office. There's a variety of places that they can see you and they see you um, on, according to fees or go, according to a sliding scale. Um, so if you're looking for someone in private practice, they are going to make in and have everything to do with their own schedule. So they're not going to be a whole other, a whole bunch of other providers that are part of your therapy. So basically, um, you're not going to have a case manager in private practice usually. You're not going to have a social worker who's part of, pri pri part of private practice. You're not going to have a psychiatrist usually who's part of that private practice unless they are the psychiatrist in private practice. When you have um, integrated, um, integrated settings like Grady Hospital, you will have clinics. So you have the out adult outpatient clinic the, like the one that I'm at. Um, Neo Clinic is one that they treat folks who have depression, suicidality, and interpersonal violence. Uh, Grady Trauma Project basically focuses on folks who have, they have depression, but also trauma related to that, that depression. With the adult outpatient clinic, we do have people where you will see, you go through and you triage, so they kind of decide on what's going to be going, they talk with you about how you feel your needs can be best met, and if that means psychotherapy, individual psychotherapy, as well as medication management, as well as case management, as well as um, some other, uh, as well as vocational rehabilitation. All those things can be addressed in uh, that type of, in our outpatient setting. Um, so that you will be able to kind of have a full wraparound services with regard to those situational, environmental, and biological um, nature of the depression that you might experience. Emory University also um, is a setting where they can see you for um, individual therapy and med management, uh, and that's Emory Clinic at Executive Park. 
what do you do if you're uncomfortable? So what if you are, you connect with that person, you really are not feeling that person, you kind of try them out a couple of times, but it just doesn't really seem like it's working. That's okay. Um, it, it, the process to getting to the person that does get you, it might be a little bit longer than you'd hoped, but it is okay. First of all, what you want to do is kind of talk. Why do you feel uncomfortable? Are they not um, addressing what you feel is important? You know, and if that's the case, then you can set limits. If, the, if you, even if, if you're with a psychiatrist and you don't want to take a certain medication, have that discussion with the psychiatrist. Uh, hopefully I'm not lagging. It says my connection is unstable, but have that discussion. If you are not taking your medication because it, you have side effects and you don't tell your psychiatrist that you're not taking the medication and you, and you feel like you don't want to have to keep taking more and more medication. But if you don't let your psychiatrist know that you're not taking in the first place and all you tell them is not working, what are they going to do? They're going to give you more medication. They're going to give you a higher dose. And you have to be very open and transparent. Let people know your concerns. Um, if you, uh, and then you can set limits. It's like, okay, um, if I'm seeing Dr. Barnett, Dr. Barnett, Barnett, I, you know, I'm not really feeling that Prozac. Is there anything else in Prozac is an antidepressant? Is that, is there anything else that might work with my, with my, instead of Prozac? Cause I'm really not about that. Or, you know, I'm really concerned about weight gain. I don't want to be weight. I don't want to gain weight. So what can you give me so that I can have my decrease, my depression decrease, but not my weight increase? Cause I'm not about that either. That'll just depress me more. So in those instances, voice your concerns, set your limits. I'm not willing to do this. Is there a way for us to address that? If there's a certain type of psychotherapy that you're involved in that you don't agree with or does not sit right with you, and I'll talk about a few of those in a few minutes, um, let us know. And we can always stop, re re you know, rewind and pivot, not a problem. And always require collaborative treatment planning. You are the expert on you. I am not. What's important is that it's it's the information is shared and shared in a way that's collaborative and in a manner of trust. I am always going to 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 look to you to talk about what are the best practices for addressing your depression. If all else fails, I'm not doing my job, or you don't like the way I'm doing my job, or Dr. Barnett the way he's doing his job, then you contact somebody else. That is okay. Research, do research. People, when you reach out to people initially, it's okay to ask them questions about the type of psychotherapy they do. What are, what is their orientation? What is their background? Which is why I provided a little bit of mine, so you get to know what that person, where that person's credentials are, where they came from, and it's okay to ask. And in that first session, they're going to ask a lot of questions for you so they can get an idea about what's going on with you. And, you know, some things are going to be uncomfortable to share. Some of these things you've never shared with anybody in your life. And so you're going to, you have to build that trust, but you're going to have to share some things so we can be really informed about how to address your depression. Otherwise, we might miss the mark and then no one's happy and you'll be looking for other people when the, when the issue might be something where we're not just fully involved in, in, in getting all the information that we, we can to kind of help with these with this process. But by all means, if it's not working, please find somebody who is a better fit because if you are with somebody and continue to work with somebody who's not a good fit for you, really it's going to prolong the success of your treatment. So if you're staying in just because you don't want to hurt somebody's feelings, hurt my feelings, please hurt my feelings because I want you to get the best treatment that you can get and most effective treatment that you can get because nobody should have to live with severe depression or depression that isn't severe, just get it addressed. Um, okay, so there's several approaches to, um, psychology approaches to dealing with depression and, and discussing depression. These are just a few. Um, basically, one of the things that we usually, and these are evidence-based practices, meaning that these, these treatments have been, have been tried and true, right? We, we tried them out, we test them out, we've done research on them, and we, they've been proven to have positive changes with most people, not everyone, but most people. So one, and again, as uh, Dr. Barnett pointed out, these, these treatments are great. But having these treatments and medication management, when warranted with severe uh, uh, major, medic, ma major depressive disorders, is going to be your best, most optimal treatment. But with CBT, basically, we're really looking at um, working on changing 
your thoughts and behaviors and improving your emotional regulation. When I talk about changing your thoughts and behaviors, when you're depressed, all kinds of negative automatic thoughts kind of pop into your brain. I'm a loser. You know, nothing will ever get better. You know, people hate me. Um, I just, I don't, if, if, if I go to sleep and never wake up again, it won't be a problem. Those types of things pop into your head. So what we want to do with CBT is look at those thoughts and what that's how within the related behavior, because when you have those thoughts, you might not get out of bed. You might not take a, you might not brush your teeth. Some people don't take a bath for months, literally for months with serious, serious major depressive disorder. So that is not uncommon. It is something that you want to kind of work on changing. So what you do is you talk about these, these, these negative thoughts and work on developing more positive thoughts and taking steps to change the behavior with, with in mind the positive thoughts. So if you're thinking all this, if you think I'm just a loser, everything always goes wrong for me. With CBT, it's negative thoughts about yourself, the world, and the future. So we want to address, okay, well, today I am doing the best that I can do. Tomorrow I can do one more thing. And the next day, the next. So just putting into place those those opportunities and those thoughts for every negative thought, we write down 10 positive thoughts and have a positive thought that you can put in place of that negative one. And you rehearse it. You put it up on your walls, on your mirrors. I have people write it down on an index card so they can take it with them wherever they go. It's not stuck on the mirror at home when they need it. Um, and also to improve emotional regulation. Sometimes, as Dr. Barnett alluded to, there's not just sadness. It's There's irritability. And so you can be really short and really snappy with people when you're depressed. And when you're in pain, oh my gosh, it's even worse. You can't, it's, it's really hard to be nice to somebody when you're depressed and in pain. No. Um, so there's that. So I'm going to move on really because I'm, I, I'll talk too much. Acceptance and commitment therapy. Really with acceptance and commitment therapy, it's really a combination of acceptance of what is happening and being mindful and being in the present moment and incorporating some what we call psychological flexibility. That being said, you might, okay, we're all in the midst of COVID. COVID really is not the greatest. I I always say COVID sucks. I'm sorry. Hopefully that's not offensive to anybody. But, you know, we're in a really crappy situation. But does that mean we have to be depressed in that? We accept that we are in this situation. But there, to be, to kind of focus on some of those positive things um, in this situation, try to think about those things that are blessings. Some people think, you know, COVID is going on, but I'm, I, I, I have a, a roof over my head. If they don't have a roof over my head, I'm alive today and I have resources. So it's creating that, that, that flexibility and the commitment to change your behavior. When, when you have a thought, a negative automatic thought, usually people kind of have what we call cognitive fusion. So that thought is connected to behavior and we don't really differentiate between. So if I'm a loser, then I, I don't do anything. I don't want to be around people. So I'm not going to get out in the world, but we can have that thought and not have the behavior follow. So we can have a negative thought and say, like, well, you know, I might, I'm not at my best, but I'm going to still go into work today. Um, as uh, Dr. Barnett also pointed out, some people don't show outwardly that depression. In fact, some people do the exact opposite. When they're feeling bad, they dress up, they put their makeup on, they're out, they're going to try to do their most, the most, not to show that depression. And finally, um, behavioral activation. Really, when we talk about behavioral activation, we're going to increase positive reinforcement and decrease those negative behavior and patterns. So when you are when you are severely depressed and you're in bed and it's hard for you to get out of bed, what we want to talk about is, all right, I got you. I I understand it. I can I can relate that the situation that you're in is not optimal, and that you start to feel bad about just being in the bed all the time. What about let's talk about maybe brushing your teeth once this week and then you up it up up the ante twice this week if that if hygiene is not a challenge for them but you're just getting out and being around people what about getting outside walking to the to the, the uh, mailbox and coming back let's try to do that three or four times a week and then you up it the next time all right well you made it to the mailbox why don't you take a drive and, and drive your car to the gas station and put some gas in your car just it's, it's getting that positive reinforcement, but small steps, not huge things. If you're not getting up out of the bed and taking and taking a bath, deciding to go into work, you know, when you haven't been there for months, 
that's not that's a huge step we want to try to do those positive things so you get positive rewards you start feeling better about your accomplishments over that amount of time and then when you start to feel better about your accomplishments then you you feel better about maybe doing other things and it decreases those negative behavior patterns if i feel good about myself and i feel less depressed i'm going to maybe i'll talk to i'll talk to dr barnett on the phone when i didn't want to have anything to do with him when i was really really depressed so there'll be those types of things that we're looking at behavior activation just getting out and doing things incrementally because depression you don't want to do anything you don't want to talk to people. You don't want to be around people. You don't want to get up. You don't want to even those things as Dr. Barnett talked about anhedonia, things that brought you, brought you, uh, you were interested in, brought you pleasure before, just like your kids or your grandkids. You don't, you ain't trying to be around them anymore. So when you notice those things, you want to kind of talk about those things with your psychologist or your psychotherapist. Um, what are some things to kind of help combat that and manage it? Get in a routine. You know, start out, this is what I'm gonna do every day. If it is just getting up, brushing my teeth, that's all, I'm gonna do that every day. I'm gonna set goals and I'm gonna complete that every day. Getting out and exercising is important. And that doesn't mean you have to go run marathons. It means maybe just walk or climb up and down steps. Eat healthier. Um, as you're eating healthier, you know, to kind of eating healthy. And and when I mean eat healthy too, I mean, look at, look at your diet. You know, COVID has brought some, very difficult times and my diet is pretty much out the window most of the time is junk food and all that but I know that I have to eat a salad or something green every once in a while so you want to do that that helps with your depression get enough sleep um, and Dr. Barnett talked about having too much or too little but really just getting an adequate eight, eight hours of sleep take on some responsibilities when you weren't before okay well I'm going to um, take the responsibility for walking the dog this time um, as opposed to where I was going to let it go, you know, let somebody else do it. Um, also, what's really important is I, I talked a little bit, I talked about the negative challenges and those negative thoughts that pop into your head. I'm doing the best I can right now. But really, some people like to turn to supplements. Uh, when you when you think about supplements, um, also make sure you check in with your, your uh, psychiatrist because those supplements can interact with prescribed medication that you have already. And they can lead to some pretty nasty outcomes if you don't involve your uh, psychiatrist in that. Do something new, Take, read a new book, join a podcast, do YouTube, something, something that's different that you can look forward to. Try to have fun, it's hard. That's easier said than done when you're depressed. It really is. We're asking a lot, but if you're gonna kind of manage this on your own, Try to do something that to get back and try to make it fun again. If you've never tried a video game before in your life, use your your you know your smartphone or something and try to do that. Or you know maybe have your your kids show you how to play one of their video games. And then again, like I said before, I mentioned before uh, that medication and CBT or psychotherapy that's going to be your sweet spot in really kind of helping managing the depression. All right, so I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Beatty Gray. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Uh, now we'll have questions from the chat. Um, Dr. Cherry Hill, do we have any questions from the chat? Hi, yes, thank you so much, Dr. Barnett, Dr. Lee. That was great information with many points that we can take home and apply. We have one anonymous question. What certifications should you look for when choosing a mental health professional? Uh, I'll start off with the easy one for the <laughs> for the physicians. Uh, definitely, you, you want to make sure just about any physician you're going to interact with is uh, has to have a medical license in the state of Georgia. Uh, but you definitely want to make sure that they're board sort of certified. That's one of the few ways that we can uh, kind of stratify um, uh, providers. Essentially, it's like like if you're getting eggs or getting meat, you want to make sure you're getting grade A uh, and not you know, C, D, or E. Um, and, and I do want to uh, piggyback on something that Dr. Lee said earlier uh, in terms of advocating for oneself. Uh, in general, our clients in mental health have difficulties advocating for themselves. And I think many of us in the uh, Black and African American community sometimes also maybe defer a little bit too much um, to their providers. Um, and we could, one could go into why that might be in some instances. Uh, of course, there is a fear of, of uh, uh, physicians and mental health providers as well, given uh, our history of experiences. But it is important to, to let 
your providers know what your experience is, good or bad. We're not going to be hurt by it. Matter of fact, it only serves uh, it only serves you uh, to let us know uh, that we're working well for you or something isn't working well. Um, uh, I feel sometimes I feel it's even more helpful to know that something isn't working because I at least know the patient or the client has tried it. <laughs> and then we could talk about why it hasn't worked and the timeline of maybe talk about expectations because um, that's something we didn't really get into and I'm, I'm kind of going off rail in terms of this question, but definitely you, you definitely want to have um, a board certified, uh, a psychiatrist board certified uh, in uh, psychiatry and neurology. With regard to psychology, we some you will find that you have some psychologists who are, um, according to psychology's board certification, and others who are not. That's not our, our our bar is a little bit different than psychiatry. So for you have to have for someone to call themselves a psychologist, they have to go through uh, take several tests. So they have to be licensed to call themselves in the state of Georgia to call themselves a psychologist. You can have a degree in psychology. But that does not necessarily mean that you can you can't in Georgia call yourself a psychologist. So that's going to be one of your main uh, differentiations uh, with regard to psychology. Um, also, with psychology, you really want it, it's going to be depend on exactly what your presenting concern is around that depression. So you really want to, if we look at levels of severity, you really want to look at maybe a clinical psychologist um, because a clinical mm -hmm. psychologist might have a little bit more expertise in those clinical areas as opposed to someone, like I said, who is a school psychologist. A school psychologist can address and knows about depression, but your clinical psychologist will probably have a little bit more training and a little bit more expertise in that area. So really when we talk about like major metal, major depressive disorder or more major depression, you really want to look at clinical psychologists in particular. Counseling psychologists also can address um, your more severe forms of, of depression. But again, that's, that would be one of those things that you can look at. But again, you can have really well-trained um, psychologists with different specialties. So it really is about like talking to that person, asking them what their expertise and background is in working with the particular concern that you're coming to the psychologist, psychologist with. And I also wanted to piggyback on what Dr. Barnett says, especially with this, with the medication. Psychologists will, if you come to the psychologist and say, well, it's not working, I've been trying it for two weeks, and we're like, well, it's not like Tylenol, where you take Tylenol and it, and it addresses your pain and it lasts for 12 hours. No, with antidepressants, and, and Dr. Ryan, uh, can correct me if I'm wrong, it takes a while. You've got to kind of take it a number of months for it to get in your system, a number of months, weeks to get in your system, sometimes from three weeks to a month, to get in your system to, to, to reap the benefits, to recognize the benefit of taking that medication. So we always ask people, to just give it a chance for a while and, and, and work through it. And then if it doesn't, if you still are feeling like it's not helping, then, then talk more about it. And when it comes to responsive treatment, because I just kind of talked myself out of time <laughs> during my presentation, but the studies, when, when you talk to physicians, whether it's your primary care, and primary care and family doctors are the ones that treat the most mental illness, to be honest, right? Now, the psychiatrists and psychologists are the ones who, who treat most of the severe presentations of mental illness and uh, mental health issues, but the primary care docs or family medicine docs, they see a lot of individuals with depression. Now, I would recommend if anybody, um, if there are providers that are watching uh, and individuals who are suffering from major depression, not just feeling down or depressed, but if it's a moderate to severe major depression, I would recommend that they get a referral to a psychiatrist and a psychologist and or therapist. Uh, when it comes to response to treatment, I tell patients all the time, with the way studies are done for medications, we don't actually start to look for recovery and response before two weeks. So we're looking at two to four weeks before I'm telling patients we should know yeah. if this medication is working for you. But what I do tell them is that doesn't mean you can't feel better tomorrow. It just means I can't say when you talk to me that next day in the hospital, like, hey, I feel better. I just can't be like, <laughs> yes, I picked the right thing. It has nothing to do with that. There are a whole bunch of factors that are going on there particularly in the hospital, one, they could be away from a stressor or trigger. Uh, two, 
uh, with whatever has gotten them to the, by, by the time they see me or even if it's outpatient, they have gotten, uh, they're responding to various support mechanisms mm-hmm. and individuals that are around that maybe they didn't recognize or, or even know about before. And just as I mentioned with uh, the uh, religious and spiritual component, the mind is a powerful thing. You know, we talk about placebo as if it's a bad thing, and it's a bad thing for companies that want to market a medication and say this medication is special. But what it's not telling you is with, with placebo, that means there's a group of people that had a recovery, had a response, and it wasn't because of a medication. It was either change in behaviors or even the power of their mind. So I, t- I like to focus on that with patients, just like you can feel better. And if it's because of your mindset, that's powerful too. Thank goodness you have that. You know, hopefully the medications and whatever else that we're offering, you know, uh, various psychotherapies as well, is going to be helpful as well in maintaining that recovery. But so when you hear somebody, when you hear providers say uh, two to four weeks, technically that is true. But I don't want that to be discouraging to anybody because you can have a pretty quick response. And that's not to say that what that person had experienced before was any less severe or impairing. Thank you. Dr. Hill, any more questions from the chat? Yes, we actually have a couple more questions in the chat. So I will go ahead and ask the next one. How do you convince a loved one that she's depressed? Many people that are depressed tend to be in denial. And kind of to piggyback on that, what advice would you give to a family member who is having a depressive crisis, but the family is concerned about calling 911, given that law enforcement doesn't always handle mental health matters um, in non-lethal ways? Good question. Dr. Lee, did you want to start or you want me to? Go for it. (laughs) Okay, so um, with I'll start with the second half first. As as Dr. Lee had mentioned, uh, you know that's uh, yes, calling nine one one. I I wouldn't recommend that. Um, I would recommend uh, calling the crisis lines, uh, as Dr. Lee had mentioned. Now, mind you, depending on the situation that they become aware of, they still may. Uh, have police come with them. Um, that, that's just a possibility. But at least there should be, uh, you know, trained mental health clinicians present and involved to to mediate what happens from there on out. Um, and many times, eh, not all the time, but many times, they may even recommend instead of having, you know, people and authorities come to the home, if that individual. Uh, you know, has individuals with them, trusted individuals with them, they may ac- actually recommend that those individuals take the person uh, to an emergency receiving facility or an emergency room or, or uh, nearby psychiatric facility. Uh, many of the facilities either have 24-hour evaluation offices um, or they stay, or the evaluation offices stay open pretty late. Um, that, that's what I would recommend. So, uh, I mean, 911 has its, has its purposes, but uh, in this regard, I, I completely agree. Uh, they're, they're not suited for it, and that's, that's not their role in the community. Yeah. Um, and um, individuals can be overwhelmed, and we've already seen over the past three years uh, how situations can result in individuals who themselves have needs yeah. get injured or killed, and those who are offering help to those individuals, train, you know, actual trained clinicians getting injured in those situations. Um, so I can definitely understand the concern uh, there. And if you could, what was the, f- what was the first, the first question? Just so I, I can stay on point with that. How do you convince a loved one that she's depressed, given that many people depressed tend to be in denial? Yeah. Uh, did you want to go? Sure. So with, with, with that particular scenario, it's, it's a bit challenging. And mm-hmm. in those instances, you really wanted to kind of talk to your loved one about how, um, if they're feeling or behaving in, in a way that they don't usually behave, you know, okay, well, is there something that you think might 
help you feel better if they're willing to acknowledge that they don't that they don't feel well. And if we're not addressing it now, maybe there's something else going on. Maybe somebody else can talk to you or to us about what's happening here. Even if you don't feel like you're depressed, something is happening. Something is going on. And maybe even if you want to talk about it, if it's life coach, if people can stomach life coach uh, better than a psychologist, psychologist or psychiatrist, really we're just talking about let's try something different because you don't seem happy right now. So it really is talking to how it's going to benefit them. Um, and yes, people who are depressed tend to be in denial, but they sometimes um, will acknowledge that something something is not going right. Something is wrong. And talk about, okay, well, how do we address the something that's wrong? We don't have to call it depression. and We don't have to call it because some people see depression as crazy and I'm not crazy. All right, well, we're not going to put that out there. There's something that's not right. There's something that's not working. So how do we address what's not working? So it, it, you might get your foot in the door by not using the word depression. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Renat, what do you think? Yeah. And, and I would also stress, you know, being being honest with that person in terms of, I mean, of course you have to, you know, gauge with your knowledge of that individual, how you say it, but, you know, being honest with your observations and your concerns. And I would even say uh, persistence. Um, uh, there's no getting around. It is very, very difficult. Um, and it might help um, depending on if there are other individuals that also recognize that there's someone suffering. Uh, this sounds like a strong term, but, uh, you know, even having an intervention saying, hey, I'm going to get some loved ones and family and friends. It doesn't have to be a larger group. It just be two or three people just say, hey, can we sit down and talk? We're concerned about you. This is what we've seen. And this isn't, this is, this is a change. And we want to help. What's going on? How can we be of help to you? Um, and the, the sooner that one could do it, obviously, uh, the better, because uh, the longer it goes on, uh, you know, individuals kind of, we dig in our holes, <laughs> right? Uh, and particularly with depression, if, if someone is isolating, you know, they have their own echo chamber. Uh, and even though these, there are these, all these negative and negative thoughts, they are recurrent. And they, and as I mentioned before, they reinforce themselves and people can have a perspective in their mind that is real to them, that is not actual, that's not reality. Um, it's much like, you know, I have these glasses on and of course they help me with my vision, but someone with 20, 10, 20 vision comes on and puts these things on, it, it warps things. Right. They don't see reality, they don't see things as it truly is, whether it's the, the shade of things and everything is muted or things are warped, now this appears more, this appears bigger and everybody else is like, why, why are you getting so upset over some, some small thing? You know, um, or something big has happened and I just don't have any energy or motivation to address it. Why is this not important to you? You know, um, so it's, it's that persistence uh, for individuals. There might be individuals that might not respond to this, but, you know, being gentle <laughs> uh, with, you know, introducing these concerns. But I would also say that for me, the persistence is the thing. And that could be that could be trying for you. That can be very difficult to continue to do. Uh, I'm, I mean, I, I myself have, have had to do this. Um, and sometimes you have to take a break. So I've, I've done what I can. And this is a professional telling you. <laughs> I said, I've done what I can. Uh, I'm going to continue to do what I can to, to try to help this individual see my concerns and, and see where I'm coming from uh, and try to get uh, the help that they need that I can't provide that particular person. Um, then you just have to continue to do it. Um, you know, and hopefully avoid having to go up to those higher level of interventions uh, as, a, as a second question had led to in terms of do we need to do, you know, a crisis line or 911. Um, yeah. All right, we have a few more questions in the chat box. Um, this next one is a very, I think, you know, serious kind of end point for depression, which is suicide. And many people are really scared to bring up that topic of suicide as they feel it would cause someone to then potentially take their own life. What are your thoughts on this? And how do you address a person that you think is contemplating suicide? 
as a psychologist, I take a very different bent when I'm in session as I do out with loved ones or people not in therapy with me. But if there's someone that I, that's coming to me in therapy, and this is going to sound kind of flippant, but it's not, I basically say, you know, those degrees on my wall, they say psychologist. I went to school to be a psychologist. And that means I, w I went to kind of help people change their situation if they want to be part of their recovery journey. Um, so if you're feeling like you are, are, are not wanting to, some people say, I just don't want to live. I did not go to the school to be a mortician. They deal with people who are dead. I deal with people who you might not want to live in the situation that you're in right now. In this situation, you just don't want to go on. How can we change that situation so that you will want to be able to and can adapt to living, moving forward? Some people, you know, I, as Dr. Marinette alluded to earlier, with homelessness, that's going to be a situation that's, for some people, are depressing. So, and they might want to end their lives because they're homeless. And they, at one point, had a lot of money and a house, and they had relationships, and they had food. Well, okay. Well, let's talk about how to 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 access those resources. Be it therapy, be it uh, medication, be it case med, all these other things that we can kind of work to help change the situation that you're in, so that you can see the benefit of living, moving forward. Uh, with someone outside that's not in therapy with me, depending on who it is, it's like, look, we need to go see a psychologist. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Or a psychiatrist. <laughs> you know, because I, I can't do that work for them, but I can talk, definitely talk through them. I understand what it's like to be in a situation where you're not happy that's and right. you don't see any other any other options. But that's why mm -hmm. it's good to talk to somebody. So Because sometimes people, when you're depressed, you, you think in a certain way. But if you talk to someone else, they might be able to actually talk to you about some other alternatives. When you feel like I've tried everything, well, you, you haven't tried everything. And other people involving other people might help with that. Yeah, and if I can, I just want to share two things. Um, bringing up the topic of suicide will not cause somebody to be suicidal. It will not cause them to commit self-harm. If someone is doing that, that's a process that was already happening, all right? Now, we'll say if you have concerns that someone is at risk for that, be prepared to have additional discussions as to what do we do now <laughs> that I brought this up as a concern? How do we get you care and, you know, in what avenue, what arena, you know, where do we go from here? <clears throat> And uh, and also, um, Dr. Lee and I are just piggybacking on each other. I don't even know how we're getting anywhere because we just keep stacking up <laughs> on one another. Um, <laughs> when I tell patients and the inpatient, by the time they've gotten to the hospital, there there are plenty of individuals that, um, unfortunately, uh, you know, they come into the emergency room and they say, you know, I want to kill myself. And then when I see them for the first time, and they say, you know, I want to kill myself, I say, well, yeah, okay. I hear you, but I, I don't know if that's the case or not, because you're, you're going to places that you know are there to keep you from doing that. Now, I'm not saying you don't have thoughts about, you know, do you want to be alive or not? Well, let's agree. You still have some hope that somebody can change your mind. And that's where we are right now. So that's how I approach it from the inpatient perspective. Even if, you know, someone has already done something, like this is the third time they've taken three tablets of something, they know it's not going to kill them. But they come in like, I want to kill myself. Said, well, let's have this discussion again. Let's come together so we can work towards something. Now, I already have them in the hospital. And I'm, a, I'm a professional. So, you know, I have kind of a, a means of addressing that, you know, with myself and with a team of individuals that are working with me. Uh, but so far as a loved one or someone caring for somebody, again, if, you, if that's a concern that you have, please bring it up to that person. But also be prepared maybe not just with yourself, but with other loved ones or, or caregivers to, to that individual to say, again, talking about suicide shouldn't be the only thing. Cause how does that, how does that conversation end? No, I'm not suicidal. Okay. I'm done. You know, <laughs> no, you got to be prepared to have the rest of that discussion and be prepared for where that may go. Such as, I think you need some help right. or how can I help you? What direction are you, you know, what, how far are you willing to go? 
for help. And that's if they're not suicidal. If they're suicidal, then you have to be prepared to make that call to get them to Im immediately to someone that can professionally assess them and get them the, the, the care and support that they need. And that communication is key. Yeah. You want people to talk to you about if they're suicidal or not. Well, thank All you right. both. Go ahead, Dr. Hill. Oh, I was gonna say, I think we only have time for one last question. I, I see a question in the Q&A, so maybe this will be a good one to close us out. Do you find that uh, African-American communities are now more open today to disclose symptoms of depression? That's a really good question. <laughs> I think it varies. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I think it really varies with with who with the environment and who they're around. I think okay. for some people they become a bit more progressive in the way that they see mental health, and then others are traditionally closed and 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 not as open, close in in their in their level of comfort in their comfort zone with their families and their, their close ones and networks. The other thing, just culturally, um, you know, uh, women, uh, you know, have a, a very high standing, uh, you know, in our communities and as matriarchs, you know, uh, I'm not speaking for you guys, but just from, from a son and from a husband and a brother perspective, uh, you know, we see them as, Hey, they're the bedrocks of our family mm -hmm. and how much room do you have? To, to be, I'm not saying that someone who's depressed or has stress is weak, but that person yeah. might feel like it's, it's a sign of weakness that, you know, hey, my grandmother was able to do this. My yes. great grandmother was able to do this. And in these right. environments, I should be able to do it. Exactly. You know, uh, you know, African, you know, men, you know, hey, have, may have been raised, you know, like, hey, you got to pull yourself out of your bootstraps. You got to be a man, no crying about this. Right. And I think in our communities, it's, it's even, it's, it's even driven more, not just in the family, but just culturally in, you know, in our music and whatnot. So we have a lot of things and even some churches, like I said, it took me a while, like when I was in residency and in medical school um, and I was living in Decatur at the time, uh, trying to find a, a church that gave, that looked at mental health just as it did yes. medical issues. Yes. So, you know, they, they'd have individuals come in to get HIV testing but when it came to depression, it was all spiritual. Right. And to me, mm -hmm. it, it, turned, it, it turned to something that could be very positive to something negative. Mm -hmm. Because those individuals started looking at, well, if I'm not getting any better, then my connection with God, my mm -hmm. faith is not strong enough. And that goes into that negative, you know, self-derogatory thinking, again, right? Instead of being something positive and nurturing. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we have a lot of things in our, in our culture and even in our experiences here in the United States, where, um, you know, just being abused by society and by medicine that, that says we shouldn't trust uh, certain things or certain people. So we have a lot of things working against us as a community uh, when it comes to recognizing what we're experiencing and then going out. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Recognizing it, sharing it with loved ones and right. then going out and asking for help if we need it. Yeah. So yeah. I do feel it's better, yeah. but I can't say it's like, you know, miles better. It's just like yeah. Yeah. little baby steps. Oh, and the other thing is we're still working with getting a represent, adequate representation of people, with, people of color, you know, in our fields. And, um, and not just people of color, but at Black and African-Americans, right. you know. Um, yeah. You know, so that one can feel more comfortable with with right. sharing things, even though we'll tell them. And I've had to tell patients when I did therapy as a resident, uh, there's, like Dr. Lee said, there's just no time with how things are structured now for most mm -hmm. psychiatrists to do that. Um, but, you know, I have to tell, you know, African-American clients and men, it's just like, you know, hey, you know, yeah, I'm black. That doesn't necessarily mean we've had the exact same experiences, mm -hmm. clinically speaking. But personally, I was just like, but I get it. <laughs> There's a better chance that 
personally, I might have some empathy or sympathy or even some understanding or personal personal knowledge yes. of something that you're experiencing. So having more of that can be helpful as well. But <clears throat> so it, it's a little bit better. Well, thank you. Having more, of this, to... having more of this should push that forward. Great, great. Thank you both. We are, at, of course, uh, two minutes past eight. And so we want to be mindful of time. Uh, but it was a great conversation. And uh, I'd like to get the closing done. Um, I think, um, Lashandra, are you closing us out? Thanks. Yes. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm LaShondra Little, and I serve as the president for the Atlanta Suburban Alumni Chapter. Uh, I thank you all very, very much for joining us uh, tonight to discuss this, this, this topic that is really, really been taboo um, in our community. I uh, thank you to the panelists. You all have done a wonderful job. I came in towards uh, the end, but was sort of listening um, as I was driving home from work. Uh, but just know that I uh, to kick off this series that our physical and mental health committee committee is putting on with depression was during this time that we're in right now was really um right on time as even i had um some members reaching out today just things that they're dealing with in terms of lost wages lost jobs and so we're really in a time right now where people don't know where their next meal is coming from and and I know we say, you know, you can call, you can, you know, pray, call on the Lord. I know those things, but it's good to know that people understand that there's some work that has to be done as well. And there are some professionals that can help with those things. And so we are definitely, again, thank you all so much for spending your time with us. This is a series that will be happening for the next uh, few weeks. Our next topic is going to be on um, child psychology and uh, I'm mean, not child psychology, uh, disorders with our children and adolescents, mental health disorders with children and adolescents. So again, another somewhat taboo topic. And so there are gonna be some great things in store. We've recorded this Zoom session and we will be recording all of our webinars and we're gonna upload those to our YouTube channel. And so ASAC DST, A-S-A-C DST is our social media handles for everything. And you will see our postings for all of our upcoming mental health webinar series that we have coming up. So just be sure to follow us, to stay informed, and to just know at this time to please make sure that you're taking care of yourselves. They have just put a, a QR code on the screen. This is our evaluation for this series as we can try to continue to improve. If everyone would just uh, take a moment to take out their phones and capture this screenshot to really give us your feedback on how you all thought tonight went. And then that way we'll be able to make improvements uh, as we go throughout the future in planning uh, this event. Thank you again to the Atlanta Suburban Physical and Mental Health Committee. This was really, really, really good and, and very informative. And I'm just really appreciative um, of this happening um, right now. I work in government. And so I, I just really have been getting a lot of calls from people who are just struggling right now. And I, and I think this session is something that's gonna be very helpful and timely that I know for sure that I'll make sure to be able to post on our government channel so that people can know they can come and get this resource. So thank everyone again so much for joining us and I hope you all have a great night.